Yes, good afternoon everybody. Um, today we will hopefully finish up kind of the basics of the textbook, I think. So we can start uh, on exercises tomorrow. Let's see what happens. I, I think that should be possible. So today I'll just focus on finishing up the textbook and we and then we stop and then we continue with the exercises from tomorrow on. Uh, just a few words about these exercises first. Um, there is uh, a set of exercises we will take first. And they are um, they are uh, given at front there. So let me just show you the plan. Uh, yeah, there is this 200 here, there is uh, these uh, exercises here, exercises for part 2, and we will take those first, okay, there is some uh, cross-country skiing in the start here, and some penalty kicks. Uh, yeah, free kick it seems and then uh, yeah so there are four exercises then when we finish uh, going through that one we will um, move on to the you know i'm a fool i shouldn't have ah. Then we move on to the previous exam uh, exercises, which are located uh, in another folder. This folder called uh, uh, exam here. So you see there are four of them, ranging back from 2009. So there is 2009, 2010, 2011 and 2012. You see last year there was no exam in this course, and the reason is that it was kind of a change in the in the study plan, I think that's kind of led to uh, to the lack of exam last year. So we will, as I said, uh, from tomorrow on, hopefully, start focusing on these uh, exercises, which exercise which is left under uh, catalog 200 here, and then move on to these previous written exams. There is a lot of other exams here as well, ranging from back to 2003. Um, of course, you can look at them, but. Uh, there was a kind of different setup then. In those days it was an oral exam, so these exams are kind of very different from the one you will get uh, uh, early in December. So of course you can look at them if you like, but uh, I think the main point here is to, in order to pre prepare optimally for these exam, we will look at, uh, uh, use our main resources on these four. And there is perhaps some solutions here as well? Yes, there is some solutions. Okay. Then let us move to the final parts of the textbook. There are actually three chapters left in the textbook, four, five, and six. Um, today we will focus mainly on chapter four. Chapter five is not a part of the curriculum, so you don't have to read that, okay? Unless you're extremely interested. I, I do not recommend you to read it. It's kind of difficult, okay? So uh, unless you are really interested, don't spend time on that one. So basically it's four and six left, and six is a very short one. So mainly we will focus today on, uh, on chapter four. So let's uh, just take up the textbook here. And move to chapter four. <coughs> oh, I was moving a bit far, wasn't I? Okay. The title of this chapter is Game Theory and Regulatory Policy. Um, I don't know what you know about regulation, but regulation 
is a complex area in economic theory. Okay, it's related to tax, for instance. Tax is one way of regulating the economy. Uh, in the sports scene and in football, it is related to changing the rules of the game. Okay, so when we think about regulation in football, it's a matter of uh, looking into the rules and possibly making changes to these, these rules. The idea behind, of course, is to achieve something by these rule changes. But the problem is very often that if you want to achieve something, this something you do by regulating pops up in other parts that you probably either didn't expect or turned out to be unfavorable. So regulation is complex. If we look at sports in general, not only football, but other sports activities as well, we probably can remember that there's been a lot of rule changes in many sports over the last years. For instance, in cross-country skiing, we have seen uh, a lot of new events. Haven't we? 20 years ago, there were no mass starts events, for instance, but today there is a lot of mass starts events. And there are also combined events where you walk uh, freely half of the race and then classical style the other half, for instance. Um. If you look at speed skating, there has been new events, haven't there? There have been these mass start events, it's been this relay type. Do you call that in English? Log tempo, where you kind of start on one and they try to catch up with, it, with each other. Uh, we have also seen some rule changes in football, haven't we? Not very many, but a few significant ones. There was a change in the offside rule some years ago. There was a change in the penalty kick rule, as we have discussed. And there was a major important change in the point score rule. We will focus on the point score change rule now. Okay, today that's the our main exemplifying structure. As you probably remember before, mm, I don't really remember, and I think it's in the textbook. In, in the mid 80s, they kind of introduced this 3 1 0 system in certain countries. I think UK was one of the first actually to, to introduce it. And then after some years, other countries adopted it. Some countries didn't want to adopt it. For instance, Italy and Argentina didn't really want to have this system. But at some point in the late 80s, uh, FIFA decided that every country should use a 3 1 0 system. I assume you know what I mean. Oh, 3 points for victory, 1 point for draw, and, and 0 for uh, a loss. The problem, as I said, with these kind of things is that they may actually change how the players play the game. Okay? That of course, that's the idea of changing this. The reason, well, do you know the reason why they kind of introduced this 3 one zero system in football? Anybody have any suggestions? Do you think it was just for fun? Perhaps not. There must have been a reason. If you don't know the reason, will you guess what kind of reason should it be? You know, you, you know you're too young, okay? To make winning more valuable. Of course, that's the point. But uh, why would they want to do that? You know, in the late 70s and early 80s, there was a development in international football with less scored goals. Okay, it was a kind of a lot of uh, defensive play. And uh, some people in the football federations had a feeling that this may not be what the audience want to see. Of course, we being experts on football, we love zero-zero games, don't we? The application of a beautiful defensive strategy is much, much, just as much worth as the application of a beautiful offensive strategy. But of course, not every football spectator is an expert. So in that sense, it may, may very well be that uh, FIFA was right. Okay, so they wanted to reward winning more, as you correctly say, and hopefully then uh, the football teams would react to this and try to score go more goals. Okay, because in order to win, you have to score goals. Okay. Uh, 
if you look into this, it seems that it was kind of successful in the sense that uh, more goals were scored actually after this change. But what we will focus on here is that it also had other effects. Okay, and maybe those effects were not nice. Maybe those effects were worse as a total than the positive effects. So, as a net uh, construct, maybe this was not a good idea. That's kind of the focus we will have in this chapter. So let's. Uh, and the idea here is to try to use game theory to shed some light onto this. If we think about this change in cross-country skiing from interval starts into mass starts, what kind of consequences do you think that had? Why did they do this? Well, the, the argument was very simple. They said that uh, people abroad are not able to follow an interval start because it's all these times you have to. So you have to introduce an event where the first people who enters the target is the winner. Okay, that's kind of a simplifying measure. But it has other effects, doesn't it, than just that. It has, for instance, opened up for the possibility that Petter Nordhug could win some races, okay? At least in his early days, because in those days he didn't have the necessary stamina condition. So this mass start opened up opportunities for not so good cross-country skiers, okay? So the consequence was perhaps then that the uncertainty of outcome increased, okay? More people could win the race than before. In the old days, it was a very fair race. Those who had kind of the best technique as well as the best stamina won these competitions, and it was three or four of them. And you could kind of pinpoint the result list before the race. In the old days, it was either Odva Broje or Formo Juva Mieti or yeah, these guys, okay? It was kind of a limited number of people, and you knew who, who would normally win. For today, it's kind of different, okay? Because these mass starts opens up for people who has a kind of different opportunity. And of course, you could ask the question, was this also something that was intended by the International Ski Federation when they introduced these new events? Did they think about this? Was this actually planned? What about doping? Do you think the mass start event introduction could have had an impact on whether cross-country skiers use these drugs. It could have, couldn't it? Because in the old days, if I am a cross-country skier and I look up to Odvar Bro, okay, I can never beat him. There's no point in taking drugs anyway, okay? I can never beat him. He's just too good. But of course today, I can beat him. And if I have a little extra drugs, then of course I can even beat him with a higher probability. So you see, it could be a lot of different effects here that kind of comes in as a consequence of these rule changes. And of course, the, the difficult thing here is to really analyze and understand this before you do these experiments. I don't know if you know, but at some point in time, between these, these uh, 2, 1, 0 and 3, 1, 0, in Norway, there was a kind of middle stage here. There was a one-year season where they introduced a system fairly close to what you see in ice hockey today. So if there was a draw, then there was, would be a penalty shootout, and the, 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 the team that won the penalty shootout, they got an extra point. Did you know this? No, that was actually the case. What kind of effect do you think this middle system had? Would it be more offensive or more defensive play, for instance? Now what happened was, in a sense, at least in retrospect, easy to predict, okay? Because the possibility of gaining an extra point through this penalty kick turned out to be very interesting for the bad teams, okay? So in the old days, when the bad teams, perhaps at least at s in some matches, tried to play offensively, they stopped completely doing this. Okay? They went for a draw and hoped for this extra point in the penalty kicks. It's easier to train to be good in penalty kicks, isn't it, than to train to be good in playing the, the game itself. So this kind of gave an, gave an advantage to the bad teams. Of course, that's good when it comes to increasing uncertainty of outcome. On the other hand, it was bad related to the main point here, which was to try to get more offensive play. 
turned out to give less offensive play. So see, this is kind of compli complicated areas, okay? You have to know what kind of objective you have, what you really want to achieve, and you also have, have to have the ability to look into all possible side effects and actually analyze all these side effects. And that's a really difficult task. So, do we have any proposed rule changes these days in football? Are you following up? There was a report handed in to the Norwegian Football Association the other day, wasn't it? It was a Swiss company called Hypercube. Have you heard about this? Dutch, Dutch company, perhaps. It's not Swiss. I thought it was Swiss, actually. Hmm. Have you seen the report? <coughs> no. I have a copy, actually. So, what is their, uh, their suggestion, Christian? Yes. Uh, and the of teams. Yeah, th among several others, of course. They have all these classical assumptions. We, we should try to get more good Norwegian players to stay in the league. If we buy foreign players, we should buy better players. And this kind of rubbish, okay? Which is kind of obvious. But these are these two suggestions. Introducing a playoff and reducing the number of teams. What do you think about this? Is, is these good suggestions? Or maybe I should rephrase my question. Is it easy to analyze what will happen? Oh, it's not easy. It's extremely difficult, actually. And we can start thinking a little bit about this, OK? If we start about reducing the teams, OK? If we reduce the teams, of course, then several teams who are now playing at the top level will have to play at the lower level. These guys will get reduced demand, OK? So if the idea here is to increase demand, we have identified one part of obvious demand reduction. Okay? On the other hand, those who play at the top level will now suddenly play perhaps more interesting matches against more even competitors, and the uncertainty of out outcome will kind of increase in this reduced league. On the other hand, it could be that if this reduced league kind of contains the same, same teams all the way, it will be may maybe too many games between these good teams, that in a cell uh, by itself may lead to reduction. The other aspect of this, if we move out of the demand side or the economic side, could be kind of the quality of Norwegian football. And uh, perhaps that is the most important argument, that uh, if these best players are able to play more high-level matches, they will be get better. Okay? Th that seems like a sensible argument. Okay? I, I, I can accept that. On the other hand, it could be that there are some big talents down there who are kind of now suddenly playing at a, a different level, which makes it possible that you may miss these talents. Okay? They do not come up to the top level, so you miss them. So they stop playing football and start playing accordion instead, or whatever. Okay? I don't know if you heard this famous story about the tuba. Have you heard that? No. Okay. I will not try to tell it. I think it's difficult to tell, but it's a, a classical story in the Norwegian national football team uh, about the time when Jon Kader and Jon Arne Ries had, had their debut on the, la on the national team. And there was they were losing, I think, against Finland. And at the banquet after the match, then uh, this old president of the Norwegian Football Association, Per Omdal, have you heard about him? Yeah, he was um, giving a speech after that banquet and then he he suggested of course that Jon Karev and Jon Arne Riese should skip football and start playing tuba okay that was kind of the story you have to you have to be able to tell it mimicking him to make it funny okay but you, you see the point I think so we have kind of come to the conclusion I think that it's not easy to make these changes what do we know we know that football is popular don't we we know it's the most popular sport so in my opinion, you should be very careful with making changes, okay? It's a big risk, it's a big experiment, and you, you need to be fairly certain that you achieve what you really want to do. And as the examples we will look at uh, will, will, will show us, it's not necessarily that easy to, to over overcome all possibilities. Of for instance, the fact that mass starts in cross-country skiing may have adverse or negative effects on athletes doping use is something which is not 
probably thought about when we introduce it. Okay. Okay. Now let's go into uh, details here. There is this uh, concept of dynamic roots here. There are basically two different reasons why it's necessary to change the rules of different sports activities or for that matter what any kind of entertainment activities you look at. It. And the first one is related to the fact that the surroundings mi may change. Okay, So if consumers suddenly find football of less interest, then of course football will have to do something to try to gain back the interest. If that could be due to changes in the consumers themselves or it could be that other sports are coming up being great competitors. Okay, That's kind of one thing that might happen. The other thing that might happen is that I, what I like to call a technological change takes place. Okay, So either the football players become very good doing certain stuff, uh, if Per Igelfru suddenly starts making goals on all corners, then of course it may be tricky to meet Molde, okay? because uh, you get a certain amount of corners in each match, and if you make a goal on each of these corners, then you have to do something. Maybe you have to change the corner rule. okay? Or if Magnus Carlsen suddenly finds out a certain strategy of how to, how to win a chess game, of course then you have to change chess, don't you? Because th then, then there's no point in playing it. So there is things as time moves by that kind of tells us that it's necessary perhaps to change rules from time to time, either because of outside competition or kind of inside change. So that's kind of what we mean by these term dynamic rules. Okay, then they have to change as time moves on. If you look at it, as I started to say here, we, we kind of perhaps have seen less changes in football as a product compared to other sports. And that's kind of obvious, isn't it? Because football is very popular, the other sports are kind of less popular. So they will kind of have to look at changes in order to gain popularity compared to football. And that's exactly what they have been trying to do. Okay. Perhaps not with very much success, but uh, I still think they are doing this. And if we don't see changes in existing sports, then we see new sports coming up, don't we? Yeah. Today, for instance, we have this, what's it called? MMA, is that something? These fighting type of sports kind of growing up. Um, and there are other examples, okay. Of sports who are kind of growing up, becoming competitors to other sports, of course, not yet to football. But at some point it may be. <coughs> okay. Now, let's start here. On this figure here, there are two game tables. We have actually looked at them before. We looked quickly on them last time. And uh, there was, back in chapter 3, some probabilities kind of making this, this, uh, this game situation. If you go back into table, bub, 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 let's see if I can find it, 3 something. Mm, here we are at 3, baby. Yeah, I think it's one of these tables here. Not this one. This one, actually. This table, table 3, 4, is used to make the computations for this figure 4, 1. Okay, so we kind of do it as we discussed last time, by just computing the expected point score here. And in this case, we have done it for uh, two different point systems. Okay, on the left here, uh, it is uh, the same football game, so to speak, in a 2-1-0 system, and on the right there is the same football game in a 3-1-0 system. And as we pointed out last time, we can see that the game theory here is different. Okay, We get two different Nash equilibrium structures. On the left here, we have a Nash equilibrium where Team 1 chooses the O strategy, while Team 2 chooses the D strategy. And of course, at this point, it may be sensible to think about O as of offensive and D as defensive. Okay? And then, when we introduce the change in the point system, then we get a different Nash equilibrium. Okay? So in this case, Team 2's choice of playing defensively suddenly moves over to playing offensively. And of course, that was the idea behind 
the whole change, wasn't it? To get more offensive play. So this seems nice, doesn't it? It seems to kind of correspond with what we wanted. The question is... Uh, there are two types of questions. Is this the only effect, or could we identify other interesting effects? And the second, maybe more important question, will this always be the case? Or is this just a kind of example case? So in the general, it would not be like this. Could it actually be that the opposite happens? And that is the two questions we will spend a little time on now. Okay, let me have a look at my notes. Now, if we look at the situation here, we can see something. Okay, if we look at the distance between the teams here in in this Nash equilibrium and in this and compare it to this Nash equilibrium and this, we see perhaps that something has changed here, don't we? Here, for instance, there is a distance between team one and team two, which kind of we can think is like 1.7 minus 0 0.3, which would be 1.4, okay? So in this situation, there is a certain distance between the teams. In this situation, there is a different distance. And that's kind of obvious, isn't it? Because it's a different point system, so we should expect that. But uh, we will later see that this kind of is a general thing that happens here. So this was in the 2-1-0 system and in the 3 one zero system, if we compare with the same situation here, which means this one, it's 2.5 minus 0 0.4, which is 1.2.1, uh, isn't it? Yeah, so it's, it's a bigger distance here. That distance could be interpreted as some kind of competitive measure. The greater distance between the teams, the more points to one of the teams than compared to the other team, would kind of favor this one team. So it could be ha in this situation that not only has this introduction of the 3 one zero system in effect related to how the teams play, but it could also have an effect related to competitive balance or uncertainty of outcome. That's not hard to argue for, is it? If you introduce a point system that kind of rewards winning more relatively to a draw than you had before, then you would expect that the best team, teams, who by definition are better winning than the, the worst teams, suddenly would start changing their strategy, trying to win more, okay? because they are, they are highly more rewarded. On the other hand, in the situation we are today, uh, or used to be a few weeks ago, when we were having teams struggle not to be degraded from the tip on, you could expect that these relatively bad teams, in the old days with the 2-1 system, maybe would settle for a draw. But today's system with all these points makes the distance too high for them, so they kind of have to go for a winning strategy. And by not being so good teams, then they will often more lose against the, the good teams. So in the old days, you kind of opened up for the bad teams to choose this draw strategy much more. So it's kind of to expect, I think, to, 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 to believe that um, that one should uh, get impact by this 3-1 system into the competitive balance part. And we would expect that it would be favorable for the big teams or the good teams when you introduce this 3 one zero system. And if you look on the leagues in Europe, it seems, at least to me, that uh, in most countries we have seen this effect that the best teams have been better and the worst teams have been worse. When I started watching English football back in the mid-70s, it was a great uncertainty of outcome in, in 
what was then called the top division or the first division, which is of course today is called Premier League. And most teams could win against most other teams. Today, it's uh, four or five teams on top there who are kind of all, always there, isn't it? It's uh, Manchester United, Chelsea, Liverpool, Arsenal. Am I missing any? Hmm? Manchester, Manchester City, yeah. At least today. And they, they seem to be in relatively stable the last 10 years, these four or five teams. In Spain, there are two teams, maybe three. Barcelona, Real Madrid, maybe Valencia. In Germany, there are two teams, Bayern Munich and Borussia Dortmund. Of course, there's been some changes. Sometimes it's another team, Stuttgart, for instance, but then. We see this kind of unfortunate development. Okay? It kind of segregates the teams, makes the good teams so much better than the other teams. Of course, comparing this and adding the fact that Champions League has kind of been introduced adding more money to these good teams because they are the guys who qualify for the Champions League. Then you get a bigger and bigger distance. So you see it's, um, it's not um, always a good thing to, to do this unless you really think about it. So I would really prefer that you go back to a 2 one zero system because that opens up for the not so good teams to choose the defensive strategy more often. Of course the idea with the system was to avoid that. But I sincerely believe that in the long run, you shouldn't kind of, to some extent, you may say that this kind of works like this system you have in other sports where it's not allowed to play defensively. Okay? It's allowed to play defensively here, but you, you, you can't do it because you don't get enough points. So the system around kind of forces you to play less defensively than you really would do if you were to, to build the optimum strategy. Of course, we can't make this comparison with two different point systems. You can see that, okay? Because this point system does on average give more points than this one. So we would expect it to be bigger distance here than this, no matter what. Okay, so you need to do this point, point system neutrally, so to speak. So let me show you how we can do that. Okay. Let's see if I'm able to do this now. So we stick to the same example here and use the same probabilities from the same table back in chapter 3. And uh, let us look at these four expected payoffs. We look at the OD strategic choice. We look at the OO for team 1. So we compare now the top lines here, okay? O, O, and O, D. Okay, that's the two things we look at. And we do it for each team. So we do the same for team two, uh, for this O, D, and O, O. And then we have to introduce a general point system, okay? So a general point system. Okay, let's do the following. Suppose if we win, instead of getting three or two points, we get alpha points. Okay, so and if we play a draw, instead of getting one point, we get beta points. And if we lose, we can stick to zero to simplify. The fact that we use a zero here makes it easier for us. Then we only have these two to care about. Okay, if we had to put in a kind of general variable for losing, it would be an extra one, making it more tricky. The point here is kind of the distance here, okay? As long as these two vary freely, we can always put beta as far away from zero as we want. And it will probably never be interesting to have a negative point for losing. So we, we kind of don't lose any generality by doing this. Okay. Uh, I'd like to take these out again because I want to write after here, okay? Now let's compute the expected payoff for team one under this OD assumption. In that case, if you look back on the table, the probability of winning for team one was 0 0.65, and you multiply that with the point you get by winning, which now is assumed to be alpha, not three, and then you add 
the other probability was which was 0 0.35 I think times beta of course as zero produces no utility you don't have to add it and then we do the same thing for this OO situation in that case the probability was 0 0.8 times alpha plus 0 0.1 times beta we just continue computing here and then we are at team 2 the OD situation then uh, we get EOT2 as in this case 0 times alpha it was a 0 probability that the team sh be beat the other and plus 0 0.35 but you can go back and look at the numbers if you don't believe me here and then finally the OO situation EOT2 equals 0 0.1 times alpha plus 0 0.1 times beta Now what we're interested in looking here is kind of to compare the distance between the teams in one of the equilibria compared to the other equilibria. Okay, so let's look at distance between t team one and team two in the O O equilibrium. Okay, let's start there. The O O equilibrium of team one is this expression, isn't it? So that's 0 0.8 alpha plus 0 0.1 beta. And then we have to subtract the general point score T2 gets in the O O case, which is this expression 0 0.1 alpha plus 0 0.1 beta and if we yeah we can do this later on okay so this was the OO equilibrium and then we do the same thing for the OD equilibrium then of course we have to use this expression and this expression and make another subtraction here then we get 0 0.65 alpha plus 0 0.1 bet sorry 0 0.35 should be beta this one minus this one minus 0 point alpha plus 0 point 35 beta and what we're interested in checking now is whether this which we name 1 and this which we name 2 is like this is 1 larger than 2 we want to kind of compare if the teams have moved away from each other point wise in the general point score system not which kind of depends on the value we use here in in these two situations and if the first one here kind of is bigger than the second one then we can kind of argue that making these point score system change has an impact on uncertainty outcome which is not favorable in case we want to have a high uncertainty outcome of course mathematically what we need to do then is kind of look put this one up put a bigger than equal sign and put that one on the right hand side and kind of do some algebra here to 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 make it work Let's see if we can do it on the board. It's not that hard. So we get 0 0.8 alpha plus 0 0.1 beta. That is from here. And we should subtract. put in this sign and we put on that part okay you see here that 
this one is the same as that one, okay? There's a minus here, so these two are vanishing. The same here, 0 0.35, 0 0.35 minus, so that one also vanishes. This is zero, so that one is going. 0 0.8 alpha minus 0 0.1 alpha is 0 0.7 alpha, isn't it? So that's kind of what we end up with, isn't it? And alpha is the same here, so we can get rid of it, so 0 0.7 should be bigger than 0 0.65, which it actually is, okay? So here we have seen that introducing these change in point system which has the effect that you change the Nash equilibrium from an OD system into an OO system also has a kind of extra effect on the distance between the teams which is kind of what we predicted okay you see it's kind of always more difficult to show things mathematically than just by arguing for it but now we have actually shown this in general okay for this example, okay? We have shown it for a general point structure, but only for this example, for this table of probabilities. The next question, can that be this always be the case for any kind of probabilities? And that's a more difficult thing to, to answer. But the point here should be easy. We have demonstrated first by logical argument that we should expect maybe that introducing a three zero one system should have impact on the distance between the teams. The good teams should be better and richer, and the bad teams should be worse and poorer. And that's a development with which we maybe don't want to happen, okay? because it could kill football in the long run. You know, if this continues, and these same four or five teams in England, these same two or three teams in Spain, these same, it's the same in Italy, isn't it? There it's Milan and it's Inter and it's Juventus and is there a fourth one as well? Uh, maybe it's these three. So we see these kind of development which is not nice. Okay, in the long run it could be devastating for football in my opinion. So we must be very careful with doing this. Okay, it could, uh, if it leads to a situation where you only have a limited amount of Compet competitive teams in each country, then of course you end up with what the football federations has feared mostly, isn't it? The Super League. And the teams don't have to make it themselves. You already have a Super League, don't you? Because if you look at the teams in Champions League, 80% of these teams are the same from each year to each year. There are a few coming up, a few going out, but in general this is the Super League, isn't it? And it's a very dangerous thing, because certain countries don't come in, most teams don't com come in, and all the big teams are playing there repeatedly, and they, of course, get all this prize money, which is millions and billions of dollars from, from year to year. So you, a very simple change on the point system side could actually in induce these kind of changes, which in the long run could be extremely dangerous. And of course, being interested in football, I don't want to. I don't like football seeing being killed and kind of see other sports taking back on it. And that's actually what could happen here if you if you are not careful. Okay, it's time for a break.